All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time to join us for this today. I'm really excited to introduce John Michael Cooper, who's professor of music at Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas. He is the editor of a series of 64 editions of previously unknown works by Florence B. Price for, for Shermer and chief contributing editor of the Margaret Bond's signature series for Hildegard Publishing Company, which he was just talking about, a series that will eventually include 37 previously obscure works by Margaret Bonds. He is the author of, of books on a variety of topics published by Oxford University Press, the University of Rochester Press, Routledge Publishing, and others, and of articles and book chapters published in English and German on both sides of the Atlantic. He is currently finishing a book titled Margaret Bonds, The Montgomery Variations, and Du Bois' Credo for the new Cambridge Music Handbook series of Cambridge University Press. And with the last person I'm admitting, and uh, maybe not the last person, but with at least the latest person I'm admitting to the room, let's give him a round of applause, mostly silent, but I hope you hear it in your ears. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And uh, thank you, Professor Hamill, for that really gracious introduction and the honorable invitation to deliver this humble talk today. Uh, when I say humble, I do mean it. As many of you may uh, know, uh, University of California at Irvine was uh, the academic home to Dr. Ray Linda Brown, whose trailblazing work on Margaret Bonds and Florence B. Price stands as a model to all still today, and an inspiration really. To be able to speak about either of those extraordinary composers at an institution that was Dr. Brown's academic home is a very great honor, and I thank you for having me. Um, before I start, some quick prefatory notes. First, one would normally expect the name of the author of the text I'm about to discuss to be pronounced Du Bois, or Du Bois, but he was from Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and pronounced it Du Bois, so that is the pronunciation I'll use. More importantly, uh, I want you to know that this talk includes first hearings and living memory of several excerpts from Margaret Bonds's setting of Du Bois's Credo. You are among the very first people to hear this music since Bonds' death back in 1972. This is made possible by some very special guests who are also with us today. These guests include bass baritone Joshua Conyers, whose powerful and inspiring rendition of number six from the Bonds Credo we'll hear towards the end of this talk. Our guests also include members of the Georgetown University Concert Choir and their director, Professor Frederick Finkholder. And these artists all worked very, very hard under very, very challenging circumstances to pull together the beautiful music examples we'll hear towards the end of this talk. Please thank them with me. And again, my thanks to you for being here. Um, it's a frequent academic conceit to begin one's argument with two seemingly unrelated things and then try to tease out a substantive connection between the two. And that is my plan for this talk. Please do note that I'm aware of the irony of an old white guy sitting here discussing black feminism. And please note that I speak here with no arrogance and no presumption of authority, but rather simply as an ally, one whose chief aim is to stimulate awareness and appreciation of a major work that was written by a truly ingenious composer some 56 years ago, but has only recently been published and has only just begun to enter the discourse about American music and 20th century music generally. I personally am convinced, in case you can't tell, that this work is not only a musical masterpiece, but one that, if anything, is even more desperately needed today than it was when it was written. So the first of the terms I want to discuss is the first phrase of my title, black feminism, also known as womanism. Although black feminism is sometimes portrayed as an outgrowth of white feminism, this view is misleading as it construes black feminism as a pendant to a white counterpart, a view that's patently racist. In fact, black feminism is born not of white feminism or of any other white phenomenon or experience. Rather, it is born of the condition of being both black and woman. Dating from at least the 1830s, black feminism argues that racism, sexism, and classism are inseparable social constructs, which, because inseparable, must be fought simultaneously. And it asserts, self-evidently, yet apparently provocatively, that the needs and perspectives of black women differ profoundly from those of white women as well as black men. My second and seemingly unrelated jumping off point 
is that in 1904, the great African-American sociologist, educator, novelist, and civil rights activist, Edward William Edward Burkhart Du Bois, eventual founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, published the first version of his civil rights manifesto titled simply Credo. This civil rights creed was as brilliant and bold as it was eloquent, and in 1920, Du Bois reprinted it prefatory to his first autobiography, Darkwater. It became arguably the single most influential civil rights manifesto before Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s 1963 I Have a Dream speech. It was printed on placards, displayed outside churches, recited by black school children, and even printed on small cards that could be carried in one's jacket, pocket, or purse for ready reference. The connection between black feminism, Du Bois, and his credo is a little awkward because, to put it simply, the credo never mentions women at all much less the particular needs and perspectives of black women or how these differ from those of white women or black men. It's true that Du Bois elsewhere advocated for black women's rights, proclaiming that, quote, all womanhood is hampered today because the world on which it is emerging is a world that tries to worship both virgins and mothers, but in the end despises motherhood and despoils virgins, end quote. And that, quote, the uplift of women is, next to the problem of the color, uh, color line and the peace movement, our greatest modern cause, end quote. But Du Bois was, in the end, a male womanist or even a masculinist. And as Selena Simpson points out in her critique of his late Black Flame trilogy, which was completed in 1961, quote, we should expect of a feminism that it not replicate the patriarchal structure of masculine feminine, active passive, public private, nature culture that has denied recognition to women's political action, voice, and work. We should expect of a feminism that it take seriously women's capacities to be both Christ and Madonna, should they so choose." End quote. Now, that's where I hope to tease out a meaningful, but perhaps less than obvious connection. In what follows, I assert that the connection between the male womanist Du Bois and black feminism as we now understand that term was none other than Margaret Bonds, specifically via her own outlook and the ways in which she applied that outlook in her setting of the Du Bois credo. The first step in this process is to understand, du Bois, understand Bonds's own thinking regarding black feminism. A crucial contribution to this understanding is made by an unpublished letter that Bonds wrote to her husband, Larry Richardson, on December 17th, 1942. It was a difficult time for the couple. They had been married for just over two years and had agreed that he would continue working as a corrections officer in New York City, while she worked as a solo and duo pianist in Los Angeles for two months. They hoped that the West Coast economic surge that had resulted from the wartime industry boom would generate a financial break sufficiently lucrative for him to move out to the West Coast with her. Those hopes did not pan out, but the situation produced a rich series of deeply personal and at times highly emotional letters that reveal much about the issues that Bonds and Richardson faced. The following letter, which I refer to as Margaret Bonds's destiny letter, is one such document, and it reveals much about her perspective on her life, her work, and her situation as a Black woman. Quoting, my mother believes in me. Just one moment, let me move this. My mother believes in me. She loves me. She is willing to die with nothing so that I shall fulfill my destiny. Perhaps she too is an impractical dreamer. She endures and accepts for she sees, she knows. She knows that as there is the sun, I shall win. From my grandfather on down, my family all worked silently, quietly in obscurity for mankind or our oppressed race. They are not conventional people. They're individualists, thus their unhappiness and isolation. The bonds, they are considered fools. My grandmother, the child once removed from slavery, and my grandfather, the product of slaves and Indians, and my grandmother's father, an Irish immigrant, a man of courage who came over in steerage and made good, and my own father, who has great intellect and who would have been a great man had he not tried to conform to the taboos, inhibitions, and the rest of them. These are my blood, my soul, I cannot help myself this great desire to win. They all won before me, and I must go farther." End quote. The takeaways from this letter are many and complicated. 
but for present purposes, I adduce it to show how Margaret Vons's musical mission, as she put it elsewhere, was inextricably bound up with her general destiny, uppercase D, as in the letter we just read, and how Vons considered this destiny itself to be a sort of ancestral charge, one that placed upon her shoulders a personal and professional imperative to use her music to address and write the societal ills that had forced her mother, her father, and her grandparents and great-grandparents to work quote, silently, quietly, in obscurity for mankind, for our oppressed race, end quote. Another issue to be dealt with here is that of chronology. Du Bois first published his Credo in 1904 and then republished it with revisions in 1920 at the head of Darkwater. Bonds was just seven years old at that time. Du Bois died in 1963, and Bonds composed the piano vocal version of her setting of the Credo in 1965, then orchestrating it in 1966. The piano vocal version was premiered on March 12, 1967 in Washington, D.C., but Bonds never published it. And the orchestral version was still unpublished and unperformed at her death in 1972. It received a partial performance by the Los Angeles Philharmonic under the direction of Zubin Mehta on May 21st, 1972, and then was performed in its entirety by the Compton Civic Symphony Orchestra and the Los Angeles Jubilee Singers under the direction of Hans Lampel on April 29th, 1973. Fast forward 30 years then to 2003, when Rollo Dilworth, who is now Associate Professor of Choral Music Education and Chair of the Music Education Department at Temple University, prepared a new edition of the orchestral version as part of his DM dissertation. Most recently, the choral orchestral version and the piano vocal version have finally been published in my own edition in 2020 by Hildegard Publishing Company. Now, the upshot of this chronology, other than the fact that it's a lot of years, which means I have to talk fast, uh, is that between them, the lives of W.E.B. Du Bois and Margaret Bonds span more than a century and overlap by a full half century, and the text and music we'll be discussing today span more than 60 years. When Du Bois first published the Credo in 1904, at the age of 36, he was, in the words of one contemporary, quote, the best educated colored man, end quote, in the United States, and a professor at Atlanta University. His youth, stature, and institutional affiliation were significant, for all three generated professional tensions which in turn played out in the Credo itself. Atlanta University as a whole was what Du Bois would privately term the ivory tower of race, an institution that insisted, deep in the heart of the Jim Crow South, that African Americans must be afforded a superior and well-rounded liberal arts education equal to what was available to whites. This contrasted starkly with the ideas of Booker T. Washington, shown there on the right, Washington was 12 years Du Bois' senior and founder of the Tuskegee Institute just two hours away near Birmingham, Alabama. He and the Tuskegee Institute downplayed the evils of racism and taught that because African Americans had no generational history of societal enfranchisement with its attendant responsibilities, they needed to acquire, first of all, an industrial education in so-called useful trades in order to strengthen their economic position before earning full equality and advancing to the fullness of a liberal arts education. For Washington and his supporters, black folk had to prove themselves worthy of membership in white society. The gradualness of the process is called for by Washington and the notion that African Americans needed to prove themselves to whites are repugnant to us today, certainly, as they were to Du Bois himself. And so he penned his credo, a manifesto that opens with the salvo that God made of one blood all races that on earth do dwell, condemns war and colonialist exploitation, and sacralizes in biblical terms the education of children, black even as white, as the birthright of a mighty nation. The importance of Du Bois's credo is easy to understand. Modeled on a variety of sources ranging from the Apostles' Creed and the 13 Articles of Faith of Maimonides to Zola's J'accuse, which had been published just a year before, the work is a proclamation of inalienable human rights that the world color line systemically denied to Black folk, and more importantly, a declaration that the writing of these injustices was divinely mandated.
As shown in figure one, Du Bois constructs his creed as an arch, as the divinely mandated arc toward racial justice with the portrayal of justice as the cure for capitalist and colonialist oppression serving as the keystone, the blue area and the top portion of the figure. The sanctity of this arch is underscored by the text's handling of the word God itself, for God is mentioned exclusively in the first and last articles. These two articles serve as the springers of the arch, the outermost stones at each end from which the arch proper springs. Article one proclaims that, quote, I believe in God who made of one blood all races that on earth do dwell. I believe that all men, black and brown and white, are brothers, varying through time and opportunity, in form and gift and feature, but differing in no essential particular and alike in soul and the possibility of infinite development. While Article 9 encourages us to trust and persevere in the quest whose objects have been traced in the interim. Quoting again. Finally, I believe in patience. Patience with the weakness of the weak and the strength of the strong, the prejudice of the ignorant and the ignorance of the blind. Patience with the tardy triumph of joy and the mad chastening of sorrow. Patience with God, end quote. These two articles are the Credo's only mentions of God, but the remainder of the text reads as a compendium of the desiderata of social justice movements of its own day and our own. The first two internal boussois, the brown areas here in its arch are articles two and three, addressing themselves to both blacks and whites in a world intent on perpetuating a caste system that dehumanizes persons of color. These articles introduce the arc toward racial justice by affirming in terms at once poetic and forceful, the inherent beauty, dignity and humanity of blackness and the equality of all races in the eyes of God. Articles four through six, the blue area, the keystone, which collectively form the keystone, then assert the imperative for equality of persons of all races in relationships and work before condemning war, murder, and the wicked conquest of weaker and darker nations by nations whiter and stronger as the work of the devil and his angels, a mere foreshadowing of the death of that strength. Articles seven and eight then, serving as Voussois that mirror articles two and three, return to the affirmative spirit of Article 2, quoting, I believe in liberty for all men, the space to stretch their arms and souls, the right to breathe, and the right to vote, the freedom to choose their friends, enjoy the sunshine, and ride on the railroads uncursed by color, celebrating the justice that will come when persons of all races are free and children of all races enjoy an equal education, thinking, dreaming, working as they will, in the kingdom of beauty and love. And Article 9, the closing Springer, solicits patience, not patience in waiting for whites to admit blacks into their own world built through the work of the devil and his angels, but rather patience with God, patience in the knowledge that the arc toward racial justice is divinely mandated and shall yet inherit this turbulent earth. Uh, a transition by way of an aside, the right to breathe. Is there anyone here today in May of 2021, anywhere in, the, anywhere in the world, who can hear Du Bois's proclamation of that inalienable human right and not be reminded of the grotesque murder of George Floyd, an unarmed black man by a uniformed white police officer sworn to protect and serve in Minneapolis on May 25th of last year? Can any of us, anyone anywhere, hear that phrase, the right to breathe, without being reminded of the nine minutes and 29 seconds that ended Mr. Floyd's life, a gruesome span of time that included the phrase, I can't breathe, along with the even more heartbreaking utterance, mama. And having been reminded of those things, can anyone doubt that Du Bois's words and Bonds's musical realization of them were addressed not only to their own world, but to ours, to us. This is just one of the elements of the credo that affirm, in terms at once horrifying and eloquent and inspiring, the enduring relevance of Du Bois's 1916 proclamation that the color line belts the world. 
Margaret Bonds obviously shared Du Bois's vision in ways that he would and likely would not have anticipated. Like Du Bois, Bonds suffered discrimination throughout her life and as an educated middle-class black woman who earned both bachelor's and master's degrees from Northwestern University, considered it her destiny to uplift and encourage other members of what she termed our oppressed race. But Bonds, unlike Du Bois, was a woman, one who was outspokenly critical of society's pervasive sexism and insistent that gender equality, like racial equality, was an essential task that lay before the modern world. Her own statements in interviews and letters portray her as fourfold oppressed, as a black in a white world, as a woman in a man's world, as a black who comp composed in the predominantly white social sphere of classical music, and as a woman with talent as she sardonically quipped in an interview with the Washington Post, quote, women are expected to do all the nasty things, and if a woman is cursed with talent too, then she keeps apologizing for it, end quote. Big issues, those, and I'll return to some of them presently. First, let me summarize how Bonds dealt with the considerable challenges of translating Du Bois's credo into musical terms. Most basic among these is the fact that Du Bois's credo is prose, not poetry. Because of its lack of regular meter, rhyme, and cadence, prose is difficult to set to music predicated, as Bonds's is, on the cadentially articulated metrically periodic phrase. Comparably basic is the sheer quantity of words in this text, simply because it takes longer to sing words than it does to speak them or read them and the text of Du Bois's credo runs to 505 words. For comparison, that's 46% longer than the text of Sebastian Bach's Cantata 140, which runs to about 26 minutes in brisk tempo. The length of Du Bois's text alone might have threatened to make Mons's setting of it impracticably long. Margaret Mons addressed the first of these problems, that of the metric, by generally maintaining periodic phrases in the accompaniment, but allowing the vocal parts to move in freer rhythms. More generally, she kept textual repetition to a minimum and combined some of the thematically related articles of Du Bois's text into single movements. Let's take a look at our old friend, figure one, again. As shown in figure one, articles three and four are combined in a single movement into a single movement in Bond's setting as are Article 7 and 8. These combinations also enabled Bonds to replicate Du Bois's arch-like structure, largely by means of her own credo's tonal structure and scoring. Again, referring to figure one, the elements of Bonds's arch are distributed somewhat differently than those of Du Bois's, but the parallels in design are unmistakable. The key, mode, and scoring of the outermost movements reveal those movements to be springers, as in Du Bois's text. The curve of the arc toward racial justice, launched by the first internal voussoir, is especially do I believe in the Negro race. And numbers three, four, and five collectively serve as the keystone, condemning war and capitalist exploitation. Justice, Margaret Bonds teaches through her music, is the cure for exploitation and oppression. Number six, serving as the telos or goal of the directional arc toward racial justice is an expansive movement for baritone with chorus, solo baritone with chorus. And with that arc completed, Bonds returns to a movement for full chorus in the tonic A minor, musically soliciting us not to waver in our trust that the weakness of the weak and the strength of the strong, the prejudice of the ignorant and the ignorance of the blind are but moments within this arc toward racial justice an arc that is mandated by God himself. One further point about Bonds's setting. It is tightly unified via the dactylic motive consistently presented in connection with the textual motif, I believe. See example one, the boxed figures here. This figure occurs in its original form, in augmentation and in diminution, in all movements, in voices and in instruments because of its close initial association and beyond with the textual mantra, I believe, this dactylic motive acquires a function not unlike that of a light motif. For purposes of this talk, this short talk, two excerpts will have to suffice to illustrate the arch-like structure of Bonds' setting of Du Bois's text. These are the crucial first and last movements. As mentioned earlier, in Du Bois's text, the meaning or significance of the last movement with its appeal for patience in God, 
depends on our understanding that patience is not the supplication and waiting for white society's approval that were central to the ideas of Booker T. Washington, but rather perseverance in the knowledge that the quest for racial justice is one that emanates not from other humans, least of all white society, but rather from God himself. This is what makes the last article of Du Bois's text both a logical continuation and the fulfillment of the first. And Margaret Bonds's music makes clear that she had construed these two articles in precisely this fashion. The first and last movements are both in A minor and use essentially the same thematic material, except that while number one fades out without a definitive conclusion, number seven, article nine, begins as an almost literal quotation, but then gains in energy and intensity. The reason for this is that Bonds musically drives towards the tardy triumph of joy and the mad chastening of sorrow, creating a powerful climax out of these words, both tragic and redemptive. Moreover, the last movement quotes from and alludes to the intervening five movements, so that it is not just the completion of the first, but a summation of all that has come before. Let's listen now to the first and last movements of the Bonds Du Bois Credo uh, performed by the uh, concert choir of Georgetown University conducted by Professor Frederick Binkholder. And again, I'd like to remind you that for this and the other examples, you are some of the very first people on the planet alive today to hear this music. Here's the first movement. Springer, the fulfillment of the processes. Thank you. 
those movements beautifully translate Du Bois's affirmation of the divinely ordained mandate for racial justice into music. But you'll recall that I've also promised to explain the credo from a black feminist perspective. If, as seems obvious, the centrality of the condition of being both black and woman to Barnes's own outlook inevitably transferred into her own musical creed, then how did she reconcile the contradictions between Du Bois's perspectives on black womanhood with her own? I believe that Bonza's setting delivers on this perspective in two ways, one of which Du Bois might have foreseen, the other probably not. The first, which probably would not surprise Du Bois, concerns Bonza's handling of articles seven and eight of the text, beginning with, I believe in liberty for all men, and I believe in the training of children, black even as white, respectively. The latter theme is certainly consistent with the lifelong masculinist facets of Du Bois's efforts in support of the uplift of women, but it also resonates with Bonza's own black feminist outlook. It's absent, of course, from her 1942 destiny letter because her daughter, Dionne Richardson, would not be born until 1946, four years later. But by the time Bonds penned her credo in the late 1960s, she had been a mother for nearly 20 years. By that point, the education of children, black even as white, was something that by tradition and within her own life was a part of her identity as a black woman. And so it's telling, I think, that the movement of her credo that focuses on the training of children, black even, of, even as white, is the longest movement of this entire work by about a third. And the textual and musical goal of the arc of divinely mandated racial justice. What's more, this movement, which is the last internal voussoir in Bonds's credo, and some of the most radiantly uh, gorgeous music in this entire piece, is in D major, which makes it the tonal resolution of the structural dominant that had been initiated with the credo's arc toward a futural justice back in number two. We'll talk about number two in just a moment. Moreover, although this movement features bass baritone solo, a male voice, the chorus also figures prominently. And this, this chorus, as you'll hear, is led by the women's voices, which become increasingly prominent in Article 8, the article about the training of little children, black even as white. This is a musical emphasis that was not created by Du Bois. It was created by Bonds, a black woman fiercely proud of her maternal heritage. Number six, a Bonds' credo gives eloquent and unique voice to her perspective on the condition of being both black and woman, the very definition of black feminism. Um, for this one, I don't have the video, but just yesterday afternoon, and there's no exaggeration there, yesterday afternoon at about this time, I received the audio file for this movement. So you are the very first people to actually have this movement played for you. This is the conclusion of this beautiful movement number six, featuring bass baritone Joshua Conyers with the concert choir of Georgetown University, directed by Professor Frederick Binkholder.
But there's also another and maybe even more compelling and beautiful way in which Bonds makes Du Bois's male womanist creed into one that is genuinely womanist and consistent with the ideas and aspirations of second wave feminism of the mid 1960s. This is the second movement, especially do I believe in the Negro race. A few general notes on this movement. First, just as the first internal boussois sets the curve of an arch directing towards the keystone and thence to the other end of the arch, number two of Bonds's creed affirms the beauty of the genius of the Negro race, the sweetness of its soul and its strength in that meekness which shall yet inherit this turbulent earth. Second, the melodic and harmonic vocabulary of number two is evocative of black vernacular repertoires. It's in the Mixolydian mode and its melodic vocabulary is characterized by gapped scales with particular emphasis on the fifth and sixth scale degrees, both characteristics typical of vernacular repertoires and in the, text of a, in the context of a text that affirms the Negro race, specifically evocative of Bonds's African-American heritage. Third, even though number two is solo vocal movement in the context of a larger work that's sometimes described as a cantata or cantata-like, to designate this movement as an aria by genre would be wrong. It's not an aria. It is rather a kind of gospel song, what Bonds's longtime friend and collaborator Langston Hughes described as an offshoot of the spiritual that was, quote, perhaps the last refuge of uncontaminated Negro folk music, end quote. And fourth, the form and structure of number two are determined by the principle of call and response, a central element in, element in African-American music and indeed of the worship experience in African-American churches. A solo voice, here the solo soprano, leads and then has its ideas taken up by the group or the congregation or choir, with the soloist punctuating important ideas and phrases without interrupting the flow of the choir's declamation. The whole is modeled on the way a gospel song might be sung in an African-American church, an intimately communal experience affirming the sacred beauty of blackness. And how does Bonds translate this non-gender specific blackness into a musical reflection on the condition of black womanhood? Quite simply, in Du Bois's credo, article two is the only credo, is the only article that begins with the word especially, and in Bonds's credo, number two is the only movement for solo soprano. These words for solo soprano set the divinely mandated arc toward racial justice into motion and set its curve. Du Bois almost certainly would not, or almost certainly would have envisioned those words as being in a man's voice, but Bonds did not. Instead, she entrusted that crucial role to a woman. It is black feminism in action for in the quest for racial justice and Margaret Bonds' musical imagination, black woman leads. Let's listen now to this movement, number two of the cantata of the credo performed by soprano Katarina Burton with the concert choir of Georgetown University conducted by Professor Frederick Binkholder.
Du Bois was a master of conclusions and so was Margaret Bonds. I am not. Um, and this leaves me wondering how best to conclude these remarks in a fashion that will do justice, some justice to their subject. I've determined that this is impossible. So rather than, rather than concluding, I'd like to do just two things. First, I want to submit two questions, which I hope will occasion further reflection from you, dear listener, on the nature and significance of this work. And then I'll offer a closing thought, just a short one. The first question, although Du Bois was educated in music and appreciated the musical gifts of his eventual second wife, Shirley Graham, whose 1932 opera Tom Tom stands as one of the earliest operas written by an African-American woman, he and Bonds didn't know each other and he never commented on music that was comparable to Bonds' setting of his credo. We have to wonder then, what would he have thought of her setting of his credo? of its musical treatments, of the art of his text, its combining of several articles into single movements, and its interpretation of the role of women. And a second question. What are we to make of Bonds' strategy in setting this particular text to music given the presumptive orchestra and audience demographics of the late 1960s in the United States? After all, the Credo was written at a time when less than 5% of U.S. professional orchestras contained any Black players. The same was true of professional choruses and a similar a situation obtained for audiences. Audiences at professional orchestra concerts most of the time were mostly white. The question then becomes, when Margaret Bonds, a Black woman, composed a 23-minute, difficult, classical musical celebration of the divine imperative for racial justice and gender justice to be performed by predominantly white male orchestras for predominantly white audiences, was she in effect enlisting white men, many of them not necessarily sympathetic to the cause of racial justice and gender justice, in a musical proclamation of that divine imperative? Was she using the beauty, the strength, and the sheer genius of her music to win listeners' hearts and minds over to the cause of racial justice and gender justice? Those questions will have to await future discussion. For now, let me close by submitting just this, that Margaret Bonds' imaginative interpretation of the Du Bois Credo is an artistically extraordinary and voicing, not only of Du Bois's, du Bois's own ideas, but also of a black feminist perspective on those ideas. It is a visionary masterpiece of unflagging inspiration and a 23-minute musical civil rights manifesto, the likes of which the world had never seen before and has never seen since. With that, my friends, I thank you. Please be well and stay safe because you are important. Thank you for being here.